huge honor to um, introduce our speaker this afternoon. First of all, thank you so much for coming on behalf of the Climate Center. Uh, it's wonderful to see, uh, yeah, although not terribly surprising given the speaker and the topic, uh, but, but a nice turnout. Um, it's really a distinct honor to um, introduce Colonel Gregory Dadis. Uh, I do research on and write about the Vietnam War, and I can certainly say it's a crowded field. Uh, there's an awful lot of work that gets published from year to year, month to month, week to week, <laughs> on, on the Vietnam War. Um, and yet, there are a few people whose work really stands out as fresh and innovative and important and required reading um, for any serious student of the war, I think. Colonel Dadis, Professor Dadis, is uh, someone who is producing work of that, that quality. And um, it's really uh, wonderful to have him here. It's an overdue visit in some ways, uh, uh, but, um, but uh, still um, wonderful timing. Um, Colonel Dadis holds an MA from Villanova and a PhD from the University of North Carolina. He's taught at uh, the US Military Academy at West Point for the last six, going on seven years now. Uh, he's also served around the country and indeed around the world, including recently a uh, stint in Iraq. Um, but most importantly, I suppose, for our purposes, he is the author of two really important and insightful books. First of all, No Sure Victory, Measuring Army Effectiveness and Progress in the Vietnam War, which is a wonderful analysis of the ways in which progress was measured in the Vietnam War and some of the problems with measuring progress in a war without funds. And then more recently, Westmoreland's War, which is a reappraisal of the leadership of General Westmoreland, um, engages, uh, uh, the book engages very directly in an ongoing, very lively debate among scholars uh, who um, see or do not see an important breaking point in the transition from General Westmoreland to General Craig Abrams um, in, in 1968. I think this is a, a really landmark contribution to that debate, and also simply an important book uh, for lots of other reasons besides. Uh, Colonel Dadis has now moved on to a new project, and um, though he certainly, I think, could have lectured to us about either of the older projects, um, he is uh, choosing to tell us something about new work. The title of his talk today, as you may know, is Choosing Progress, Evaluating the Salesmanship of the Vietnam War. Um, before I ask him to come up here, let me just also say a quick word of thanks to Charles Drummond. I um, am uh, delighted to be able to MC, but unfortunately I have to dash away a little bit before we'll probably come to an end, so Charles has kindly offered to uh, wrap things up in my place. Um, in an hour and a quarter or an hour and a half from, from now. Um, so with all that said, um, let me ask you to join me in welcoming Colonel Gregory Dabbs. Thank you all for coming, appreciate it. Um, so I don't know if you know this, but it's a, it's a little bit warmer in Texas than it is in New York. Um, just, just by a little. Um, I don't think we've gotten this, this like heat in uh, the entire summer up at West Point, um, which is about an hour north of New York City. So, um, so if I pass out from heat exhaustion, you'll know why. Um, so what I would like to do this afternoon is, is talk about the truth. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the whole truth and nothing but the truth, because um, that's not the truth I want to talk about. Um, in fact, the truth is, might have a few lies in the truth. Um, so the truth is going to be a truth that doesn't necessarily have all of the truthiness in it. Um, and you'll see why in a moment. So I thought it would be best to uh, actually start um, our discussion today not far up the road um, on the 19th of December 1967. And the weather in Dallas, Texas is 55 degrees, unlike today. Uh, and it is ideal for an NFL football game. And under the strong performance of Sonny Jurgensen, who threw four touchdown passes, the Washington football team held off a late comeback by the rival Cowboys, won the game 27 to 20 as a young um, 
as a young boy growing up in New Jersey as a Giants fan, anytime the Cowboys lose is, is a good way to open up any presentation. Uh, and yet far from the Cotton Bowl that Sunday um, morning, the U.S. ambassador to South Vietnam and the top military commander there appeared on Meet the Press. And in the Redskins' hometown, the two senior officials offered their assessment of a war that by all accounts, at least from the public view, had been mired in stalemate. Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker um, is contesting these notions on Meet the Press. He tells the host that he believes his South Vietnamese allies are making excellent progress toward democracy, while his uniform counterpoint, William C. Westmoreland, said he found an attitude of confidence and growing optimism wherever he traveled throughout the war-torn country. We are making progress. Asked about the possibility of a reduced American presence given such positive developments, Westmoreland foresaw within two years or less, we will be able to phase down the level of our military effort, which means that we could reduce the number of people involved. So if you're watching Meet the Press this Sunday morning before the Dallas-Washington football game, it is likely that you will conclude that the war in Vietnam is in fact being won. And less than three months later, as we know now, a countrywide attack by the combined forces of the North Vietnamese Army and the National Liberation Front, more popularly and pejoratively known as the Viet Cong or VC, sweep across South Vietnam and the Tet Offensive, Tet Offensive which is launched in late April 1968, not only wreaks havoc across the southern population, but also brings some severe and sharp condemnation from the American press. Westmoreland and Bunker in particular are painted as accomplices in this larger year-long campaign that's being run by the White House to sell the war at home. And though the Allies had, had successfully thwarted this uh, enemy offensive, it seemed that the Tet uh, period and the offensive which comes out, uh, comes out of this period exposes this yawning credibility gap in the American government and, um, and seemingly turns all Americans to include the most respected of all American correspondents, Walter Cronkite, against the war. Lyndon Johnson will fam famously slay, say immediately afterwards, if I've, lost Cronkite, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost middle America, and thus have lost the war. So there seems to be an, an either or here. Either senior officials in Washington were truly blind to what was facing them, or worse, they were publicly, publicly and purposefully being misleading in their strategic evaluations. Listen to what journalist David Halberstam had to say about this. This is uh, actually in the court case, um, CBS versus Westmoreland and Halberstam will argue that the American military apparatus in Vietnam became a vast line machine, telling Washington what Washington wanted to hear and insisted upon hearing. The purpose of this vast line machine was to propagandize our alleged progress in the war and convince the Congress and American public to support the war. So what I would like to ask this afternoon is I think an important question that we're arguably still dealing with today. Were senior war managers acting unethically by publicly highlighting the positive aspects of American strategy in C inside South Vietnam to minimize the, the war's political costs? Were they violating the public trust? Now, in one sense, I think you can argue they're not, that based on numerous assessment metrics, one could legitimately portray that the Americans and their South Vietnamese allies were in fact making progress. The enemy had in fact been stalemated on the battlefield. In, in fact, one of the reasons why Le Zuan, the first uh, secretary of the Hanoi Politburo, will, will advocate successfully for a Tet Offensive because there's belief in, the northern, um, in North Vietnam that in fact the war has been stalemated. Non-military programs supporting economic and social development seem to be growing in both emphasis and scope. The Army of the Republic of South Vietnam, or ARVN, seems to be increasing its support of rural pacification programs. We'll talk about this key phrase, pacification, in a bit. And nation-building efforts seem to be successfully ongoing. And yet, despite all these metrics, which suggest that the war is, in fact, being won, Given Westmoreland's larger mission of helping build a viable and independent and non-communist South Vietnam, 
especially in this war, as Mark mentioned earlier, without front lines, demonstrating progress is going to bedevil civil and civilian and military leaders throughout the wars. So even as they're publicly highlighting the metrics that they believe faithfully is showing that they are making progress, there seems to be a problem with these metrics and how they are being um, um, used for public purposes. So in one sense, you see that to serve the nation's interest in Southeast Asia, these senior policy makers, senior policy makers to include the president, are focusing public attention on American accomplishments in Vietnam while simultaneously cautioning that the war is far from over. There's a delicate balancing act that is going on here in 1967 in particular. Um, and yet, when you look at these public displays of confidence and public displays of uh, pronouncements of progress and then match them up with these confidential back channel messages of senior officials in 1967, a, a very different picture, picture emerges. Um, a picture that is much more forthcoming that, than these uh, public pronouncements of progress suggest. And what I would like to propose this afternoon is that this disparity between public and private comments, what New York Times reporter Scotty uh, Reston called a conversation gap, in, in fact should not surprise. That if wartime assessments appear contradictory in wars with uncertain mosaics like Vietnam and perhaps like Iraq and Afghanistan, was it wrong to accentuate the positive in public when private messages were less than sanguine? Now, part of this is a discussion then about the truth. And certainly in 1967, before the Tet Offensive in early 1968, the truth and how we discern that is preoccupying, I think, all participants of the American war. It's per, um, particularly preoccupying the Johnson White House, uniform leaders in the Pentagon, and MACV headquarters in Saigon and the media, which uh, at least one foreign correspondence will call the primary battlefield of the war. And most certainly at the center of this search for truth stands domestic public opinion. As the president and his war managers are increasingly seen by 1967, there is a race, and that race is between accomplishment and patience, as one senior White House official will argue. Uh, and thus public publicizing wartime progress becomes an integral part of war itself. So what I would like to suggest this afternoon is that far from being a unique case of bureaucratic dishonesty, in 1967, this salesmanship campaign that's being run by the Johnson White House just demonstrates the reality and what I would like to question, perhaps even the necessity of conversation gaps when assessing progress in wars in which the military struggle abroad may in fact matter less than the political one at home. All right, so where to start? I think the best place to do that is in early 1967, and senior officials who are reviewing the war are offering a measured outlook for the coming year. Lyndon Johnson, who is very much wishing to extol American progress for an increasingly skeptical home front, is actually finding very little to applaud. Um, he, he listen to um, his voice in, uh, on 10 January in his State of the Union speech. Um, and I apologize up front, my, my Texas accent is not what it should be. I wish I could report to you that the conflict is almost over. This I cannot do. We have more cost, more loss, and more agony. For the end is not yet. I cannot promise you that it will come this year or come next year. So while Johnson is publicly relating this need to keep sustained pressure on the enemy, he's also asking Americans for their patience. As he says, a great deal of patience. But that patience, even in January of 1967, already seems to be running out. That month, Time Magazine reports on the growing doubts of America's vital interests and how they are not necessarily being sufficiently threatened in Vietnam to necessitate the growing commitment there. One month later, New York Democratic Senator Robert F. Kennedy broke with the Johnson White House over Vietnam policy. And then in March, uh, in a personal setback for Johnson, civil rights champion Martin Luther King joins the anti-war movement. Even a personal note to Ho Chi Minh from LBJ to halt, uh, and a halt to the US bombing of North Vietnam leaves the president with little more than sinking approval ratings. And in short, the costs of the war, which are now running 
at $20 billion annually are exceeding the initial expectations and threatening not only the President's Great Society program, but arguably his political authority as well. Now, there is a sense, even in early 1967, that senior officials leading the war effort understand that they require some fresh assessments um, to sustain the case for continuing the American-dominated conflict. And ostensibly, and I think this is incredibly important, for upholding the prestige of the United States and its honor abroad. And we can talk a little bit about the problems with that in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, so in one sense, I think making the case for progress and thus continued patience and sacrifice at home becomes a focus that increasingly looks to manufacture that support at home. Now most certainly the White House is placing pressure on senior military officials um, for favorable reports to help this salesmanship campaign it is, as it will soon be known. But these same officers, and we should not be surprised by this, are recognizing the importance of public opinion as well. Listen to Admiral Ulysses S. Sharp, who's the commander of the U.S. Pacific Command, who's writing at the end of 1966 and into early 1967. He says that the American people can be aroused either for or against this war, and it's up to us to convince our people that there is an end in sight and that it is clearly defeat for Hanoi. So even though there is pressure from the White House to report on the progress of the war, there is a sense among senior American military officials that public opinion in fact matters and they have to enter into that campaign as well as the campaign that they're already entered, have already entered into uh, in Southeast Asia. Now despite these pressures to feed into this public relations campaign, what I have found in my research is that Westmoreland, as the commander of the military effort inside South Vietnam, is actually being fairly honest and is offering less than rosy assessments of the enemy situation. In Febu February, he summarizes Hanoi's strategy, and, and clearly this is a difficult task for any American to kind of get an inside view of what is happening um, with a, within the Hanoi Politburo. Westmoreland summarizes Hanoi's strategy as a practical and clever one designed to continue a protracted war. This is an incredibly important point for Westmoreland. He will talk about it over and over again. Um, this war of attrition is oftentimes less a war of military attrition and more for Westmoreland a war of political attrition. And here, public opinion obviously plays an important role. And in this protracted war, Hanoi is looking to inflict unacceptable casualties on our forces and establish a favorable political posture. Now certainly Westmoreland is himself in a conflicted position. He has to show progress in one sense, not only for maintaining public support, but if we're being realistic, um, for the very personable, personal reason of protecting his own job. He also realizes, however, that this conflict of strategic political attrition, his words, would not be concluded quickly. Westmoreland, I think, thus had to justify America's investment in Vietnam while admitting that the United States was in for a long war. Again, I think an incredibly delicate balancing act for any military commander. Now, how these official reports, these back-channel messages, are being translated for public consumption becomes increasingly more important, especially for Lyndon B. Johnson, as his approval ratings on Vietnam and more in general begin to slip. So in late March, the president flies to Guam to confer with the South Vietnamese leadership. Uh, upon arriving at the, uh, in Guam on the tarmac, he highlights to the press advances made in pacification and in revolutionary development programs. He declares upon his arrival that he and his allies are meeting in a time of progress. And that very same morning, uh, in private meetings with the president, Westmoreland strikes an incredibly sober tone. He notes serious problems in the South and Hanoi's unremitting confidence in victory. And one of these key objectives for the United States is to get at the will of Hanoi's leaders. And Westmoreland suggests that that is not in fact happening. As the general called, he told his audience that it was possible that the war could go on indefinitely. Now the president just says we're meeting in a time of progress and the senior military commander is now saying that the war could go on indefinitely. Thus, Westmoreland asked for an optimum 
reinforcement of 200,000 troops. And he, by doing so, I believe, leaves little uh, doubt of the difficulties ahead. So before departing Guam, Johnson softens, softens his rhetoric a bit. And when asked for a prognosis of the war by a journalist, he says, I think we have a difficult, serious, long, drawn out, agonizing problem that we do not yet have the answer for. We might think about our current president and the kerfuffle that occurred, not from the wearing of his tan suit, but the admission that, in fact, he did not quite yet have a strategy um, for ISIS and ISIL. Now, to offer proof of his strength in military position, for the first time ever in American military history, the President of the United States is going to call back a serving theater commander in a time of war. And Westmoreland is called home in April for the first of several public appearances in 1967. Now, Mac, uh, MacVie's commander presses Johnson again in closed door meetings for more troops. In summary, Westmoreland argues, with the troops now in country, we are not going to lose but progress will be slowed down. This is not an encouraging outlook, Westmoreland tells the president, but it is a realistic one. And Westmoreland, given his back-channel messages and what he's also writing in his memoirs, I think is fearing that in this protracted conflict, this attrition of political will at home matters just as much as the attrition of enemy forces on the battlefield. So in April, when he speaks to the annual meeting of the Associated Press, he acknowledges that he does not see any end in sight, or any end to the war in sight. Yet he notes a long, or he notes as, that as long as Americans remain determined, the war could still be won. While the Washington Post hails the general for his admirably forthright report, critics will latch on to Westmoreland's contention that the enemy saw protest at home as evidence of crumbling morale and diminishing resolve. He further generates debate when he addresses a joint session of Congress on the 28th of April. He's incredibly careful to avoid the word victory. Yet he cites um, heavy combat losses suffered by the enemy, an increasing number of defectors that are rallying to the South Vietnamese side and to the Saigon government side and progress within the South Vietnamese army as evidence of an improving situation. So again, you see a general here who's being very cautious with his words, um, certainly in public. Yet again, critics will point to Westmoreland's unprecedented call home during an ongoing war to report on progress to show proof that uh, Vietnam's policy is plagued by inconsistencies. Now to complicate this even further, concerns within the president's inner circle over reinforcements Westmoreland's request, and the potential for an expanded war are beginning to surface. Uh, and certainly they, they come full front um, of the inside debates in mid-May. For more than a year now, Secretary of Defense Robert S. McNamara has been privately questioning the American approach in Vietnam. And on 19 May, he drafts for Johnson an honest, it, it reads like it is anguished, critique of, of Vietnamese policy. There was rot in the fabric of South Vietnamese society, McNamara argues. The pacification effort is faltering. Corruption, widespread. The population remained apathetic to the war's outcome. Hanoi's will, far from broken. So McNamara argues to the president that the war in Vietnam is in fact acquiring a momentum of its own and that it must be stopped. In short, with the South Vietnamese army and government demonstrating little progress, Americans would never achieve anything more than a stalemate. This from the President's own Secretary of Defense. So I think you can make an argument that contemporary assessments for the President, in private, painted a fairly accurate depiction of the political and military struggle inside South Vietnam. That these reports, and they're faithfully presented, are resting on solid evidence at least from the perspective of their authors. So even if people like Westmoreland and uh, McNamara and even Ambassador Bunker are under pressure from the president to offer um, public pronouncements of progress, these senior officials are still privately giving the president their honest appraisal of the war and its progress. Now the problem is that the White House has to contend with flagging domestic support at home, not just for the war, 
but also for domestic policy as well. So when Westmoreland attends, uh, returns home in July to attend his mother's funeral, Johnson hastily calls a, a news conference with Westmoreland and McNamara and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, uh, Buzz Wheeler. Now, this is an interesting scene, right? You have the president um, who is now giving um, the press the, the Johnson treatment, the famous Johnson treatment. He describes both the successes of the policy in Vietnam. He also touches upon some of the problems, but he tells the press that he is generally pleased with the progress that is being made so far. We are very sure we are on the right track. And sitting on the couch next to the president is the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and his, American, his Chief Mil Military Commander in Vietnam. And after a few press questions, the LBJ turns to the Secretary of Defense and says, Secretary, do you have anything else to offer? No, Mr. President. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, anything to offer? No, Mr. President. And then he turns to Westmoreland and he asks the general if he could briefly touch upon this stalemate creature. And in, a host, and in front of a host of reporters, the general replies dutifully, the statement that we are in a stalemate is complete fiction. It is completely unrealistic. Now, what do we make of that? Now, without question, Westmoreland proved more candid with his confidential assessments and advice. I think there's, there's no question about that when you look at these back channel messages. That this pri private narrative is demonstrating not only the war's complexity, but also deep-seated concerns about the war not only being difficult and prolonged, but also even potentially being stalemated, despite the fact that this stalemate creature is complete fiction. So in his classified concept of the operations for 1967, Westmoreland will note that his primary mission, and this is incredibly important here to understand the complexity of what Westmoreland is being asked not only to achieve, but also to report on in terms of progress. Here is his mission. To support the Vietnamese government and its armed forces and coalesce the military efforts and civilian efforts as appropriate of the government of South Vietnam and free world assistant, military assistance forces. All right, you're ready for this now in defeating the communist insurgents and aggressors from the north, expanding security in populated and productive areas, and encouraging and supporting all aspects of nation building. There's your mission. Go. This is an immense, immense task. You have to defeat an internal insurgency. You have to defeat external aggressors. You have to build a nation. Nation building is in fact part of his mission statement. You have to achieve success in pacification, and the way pacification is being defined in this time period is creating linkages between the local population and the government in Saigon. We might ask ourselves whether any foreign force, American or not, is capable at this time of creating linkages between local populations in the rural area and the government in Saigon. And yet this is Westmoreland's mission. So when National Security Advisor Walt Rostow forwards Westmoreland's concept to achieve this mission to the president in January, he underlies, perhaps unsurprisingly, several unresolved problems. Now certainly among Westmoreland's own personal concerns, none I think rank more important than expanding security so these pacification efforts could achieve momentum. I don't think we've really evolved all that much in terms of our approach to counterinsurgency, where even today we talk about the necessity of security before governmental, economic, social programs can flourish. So no surprise then, in, then at Guam in March, Westmoreland will suggest that as things stand now, it may take at least 10 years. Now the problem, of course, for Westmoreland, given this immense task, is he has to not only accurately evaluate the war's progress to make claims of progress, but he also has to assess conventional operations which are often times at odds with unconventional non-military programs. Body counts tell only part of the story. Left unanswered, I think, are how these conventional operations against military forces in the field are impacting the enemy's political infrastructure and perhaps more importantly, the civilian population. And oftentimes in Vietnam, what you will find 
our military operations that are in fact working at cross purposes with the larger goal of linking the local population with the government in Saigon. So when correspondent Jonathan Schell finds South Vietnamese troops actually abusing civilians, he questions the very basis of American strategy and political objectives in Vietnam. How can an operation be deemed successful when it displaces nearly 6,000 refugees from the local population, Shell will ask, and I think rightfully so. Now equally difficult to ascertain, ascertain was the, the impact that this American dominated war effort is having on the will of Hanoi's leadership. Ostensibly, this is the key objective of applying U.S. military power in Southeast Asia to change, to alter, affect the will of Hanoi's leadership. And here, Westmoreland can only guess at Hanoi's intentions for 1967. And clearly, as I think we've seen with the Tet Offensive in early 1968, um, those guesses are not as accurate as um, most, would have liked to, most would have liked them to have been. Now, obviously, on the American side, this public debate is just that. It's much more public. And the debate over strategy um, is now centering on when ma what many critics are believing to be an omission of essential facts on the war's progress. And now, by early July, newspapers across the country are openly questioning official reports in Vietnam. This is a full six to seven months before the Tet Offensive even occurs. So Erwin Canham and the Christian Science Monitor, Monitor will suppose that the American people have never been more discouraged about Vietnam than they are now, while Drew Pearson of the Los Angeles Times will write of a standstill in Vietnam. The problem, I think, for Westmoreland now is a key question. Who is the audience for these public pronouncements of progress? Were they generated to achieve some sense of political support for the White House? Did Westmoreland feel a need to be a public advocate for his own soldiers? To shore up morale of the South Vietnamese government and their armed forces? Certainly airing doubts about the veracity of the Saigon government is going to call into question the war itself. We might recall about 18 months or so ago, a Brigadier General in the United States Army questioned the Karzai government and the problems of corruption within that government and was hastily recalled from Afghanistan. So Westmoreland, I believe, was all too cognizant of the need for public support but had to speak to many audiences simultaneously and is also aware of the inherent uncertainty of this public support. But I, I don't see that there is evidence of him changing his assessments, especially those in private, to help sell the war. Again, I think this is a delicate balancing act for him. Now, this is not to say that Westmoreland and his staff were mired in pessimism in 1967. They most certainly were not. Um, the MACV, um, the Military Assistance Command monthly report for June 1967, admits that there is little progress being, uh, little progress was achieved in meeting the year's campaign plan goals, but otherwise, when you read it, it, it hits a fairly upbeat tone. Now, reporting on operations the following month, Westmoreland will speak of increased enemy losses, he is correct, progress in civic action and revolutionary development programs, I think you can argue he was correct, and how the South Vietnamese Army units were continuing to pr improve in all areas. Maybe somewhat correct. Um, and the general civilian counterparts agreed. So Ambassador Robert Comer, who's head of MACV's Civil Operations Branch, wrote the President in July that at long last, we are slowly but surely winning the war of attrition in the South. Now, of course, there's good reason to be optimistic, right? Optimism has its purpose. It's positive news um, is seen as a job well done. Bad news represents failure. Optimism breeds more optimism, so it's difficult not to continue it. I think whether it's cultural, Americans generally, generally value performance, or whether it's organizational, you see senior military leaders often being hesitant with sharing their public or private doubts in public. So Westmoreland, as an example, not only is operating under the constraints of being the, the president's chief advocate for this war in Southeast Asia, 
but at the head of a military organization that is expected to make progress against a third world country's military forces. Remember, this is the nation, the United States of America, who single-handedly won World War II. The Soviet Union didn't really have anything to do with it, especially in 1965, 67, when we can't acknowledge that the Soviet Union even fought on our side in some instances. So Westmoreland clearly is uh, approaching the press carefully given these constraints. As War Just, a, a, one of the more insightful correspondents will recall, Westmoreland never predicted when the war would end, nor would he forecast the end of the beginning, of the beginning or the beginning of the end, or whether there was even, in fact, a corner to be turned, or whether there was a corner itself. Making matters worse, the question, how are we doing, remains a mystery in 1967. Staff officers from the Military Assistance Command, from CIA, from USAID, are counting hundreds and hundreds of metrics, and none of them are achieving any consensus on the vector of progress. Is the war moving in a positive direction or not? It depends on who you asked. As one USAID official noted, or CIA official, I'm sorry, official noted, what we need here is a one single Dow Jones index for how the war is going but such index does not exist and is not currently feasible. So here's a key problem. When you were asked as a general of American military forces in Vietnam, how is the war going, and no one can agree on how the war is going, how are you supposed to answer that question? In fact, I think Secretary of Defense McNamara is the prime example of publicly communicating a positive picture while expressing deep-seated concerns in private. So in July, he proclaims publicly that more progress has been made in, Vietnam, in the Vietnam War in the last nine months than the previous six years. And yet to the president, McNamara advises, his words now, the continuation of our current course of action in Southeast Asia would be dangerous, costly, and unsatisfactory to our people. Now the problem, I think, is that rather than try and reconcile these competing interpretations, of what many believe is actually becoming a stalemated war, LBJ decides to wage a more forceful public relations campaign to convince the American public that the war is being won. And in reality, the, these deliberations that are unfolding in the back channel messages, often beyond public view, suggest the impenetrability of what was largely, if not exclusively, a Vietnamese problem. And again, I think this is an incredibly important point. That in the end, the key to the entire U.S. mission in Vietnam and that long, very intricate and, um, and tall order of a mission that Westmoreland is given, um, how well the Americans were doing in terms of that mission, in terms of building a stable and legitimate South Vietnamese government, is a Vietnamese question that has to be answered by Vietnamese. And the problem then becomes when American military commanders are looking at the South Vietnamese population, and perhaps unfairly, but suggesting that most Vietnamese are politically inert. Well, if that was the case, then what do you do as an American military commander, given the mission that you have? So as the summer of 1967 wears on, these disparate assessments of the war seem to be the new norm. Uh, the American public are reading newspaper accounts of, uh, from senior officials that are stating words like progress, while journalists are using words like quagmire and stalemate. And then in late July, a Gallup poll for the first time finds that 52% of the nation disapproved of Johnson's handling of the war. A special counsel to the president, Harry McPherson, recalled Johnson sent out confusing signals to the public. We must win, but victory was not our goal. The men of Hanoi were the enemies of freedom and democracy but our ultimate purpose was to make peace with them. Thus, not only did the goals appear contradictory, but the momentum towards achieving them. So how could Westmoreland, for instance, be making progress, yet requesting more reinforcements? Senior military officials will rail against the, the press as being immature and naive, and more importantly, hostile. Um, but I would argue that these journalists are actually more reflecting the concerns of a perplexed American public than anything else. 
And in part, I think the military command in Vietnam is at fault. My, in my research, I, I, I get a sense that leaders like Westmoreland are actually unable to articulate what success looks like in 1967 based on this large mosaic of a war inside South Vietnam. As Comer, the head of the Civil uh, Operations Branch, writes the President, the whole trouble with analyzing this peculiar war is that it is so fragmented, so much of a matter of little things happening everywhere, that the results are barely visible to the untrained eye. Even to the trained eye, I would argue, um, it remains a fragmented war. And that message sours only further in early August when R.W. Apple, the New York Times, prints the now famous story under the byline, Vietnam, the signs of stalemate. Victory is not close at hand, Apple claims. It may be beyond reach. And now there is a siege mentality at the White House. Uh, the White House actually stands up a Vietnamese information group to better coordinate the information campaign. Um, two weeks after Apple's story, although the president says it, it is not an important story, um, he's still fielding questions about whether the United States has reached a stalemate in Vietnam. He describes those, um, dismisses those charges as nothing more than propaganda, but words like stalemate and quagmire, quagmire and mired remain throughout the summer. Now, these statements, accusations of stalemate clearly have rattled the administration and on 27 September Rostow will cable William Westmoreland and Ambassador Bunker and Robert Comer and will urgently request and that's the phrase he uses urgently requests sound evidence of progress but senior military officials were already complying in mid-August upon returning from South Vietnam for a two-week long trip Army Chief of Staff Harold K. Johnson holds a press conference. He declares significant progress is being made everywhere we went. Less than a month later, he gives an interview to US News and World Report. And in the interview, Johnson lauds the forward mo movement everywhere in South Vietnam. We are definitely winning, the general contends. The problem is, is that this generally upbeat <coughs> message is gaining little traction at home. And by November, when Westmoreland is now getting ready to appear on Meet the Press with Ambassador Bunker, Johnson's inner circle, I believe, has really grasped the full weight of public opinion that is not only burdening, uh, burdening the U.S. war effort, but potentially U.S. foreign policy writ large. Walt Rostow will report McNamara's concerns that any advances over the next 15 months will neither lead to peace nor convince our people that major progress has been made and that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Under Secretary, of State, Under Secretary of State Nicholas Kazenbach will write Johnson about a critical element of strategy that oftentimes we do not talk about, and that is time. Can the tortoise of progress in Vietnam stay ahead of the hare of dissent at home? And the Under Secretary even suggests the possibility of losing the war in South Vietnam. And is this, is it in this context that Westmoreland and Bunker come home to offer yet another progress report? And two days after his appearance on Meet the Press, the MACV commander gives his most important public remarks of the year at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. He dutifully conforms to the president's wishes. He offers a laundry list of indices that denote progress, all of which I think rest on a truthful accounting of MACV's accomplishments. He doesn't talk all that much about the difficulties, but he's careful, again, not to use words like victory. But the press latches on to 14 words. We have reached an important point when the end begins to come into view. And critics will see this as little more than just another performance supporting President Johnson's hard sell on Vietnam. So even though Westmoreland is predicting that this final phase of his strategy will probably last for several years, that phrase, we have reached an important point where the end begins to come into view, is an important one. And it is an important one, I think, because um, critics latch onto it and it does little to convince doubters that the stalemate hasn't been broken. So as 1967 draws to a close, I think this conversation gap that I mentioned earlier seems to be as wide as ever. David Halberstam, after his own trip to Vietnam, offers a gloomy report in Harper's Magazine. He depicts the Vietnamese society as rotten, tired, and numb. <laughs> 
and Harold K. Johnson, the Army Chief of Staff, at the Association of the U.S. Army's annual meeting that same month, offers clear and concrete evidence of progress. Increased morale of the South Vietnamese forces, prevent, um, prevention of a major enemy offensive across the demilitarized zone, and food shortages within the enemy's camp. And then, as I mentioned, in early 1968, the Tet Offensive breaks, and this conversation gap now turns into a credibility gap, and it is a visible one. As one member of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs asked, how could the Tet Offensive have even occurred if things were going so well? And apart, I think this answer could be found in the President's own need to maintain public support for Vietnam thus setting a kind of moral trap for senior military leaders given the tradition of American civil-military relations. So what do we make of all this? My research suggests that Westmoreland was never acting out of dishonest motives, even if he was not being completely forthcoming in public. As he recalled in his memoirs, I would have been out of bounds if he sought to alter policy through public statements. In fact, President Johnson will pull him aside before going to Vietnam and with a bony finger tell Westmoreland, do not pull a MacArthur on me. Thus, I think this larger national commitment to South Vietnam became the rationale for accentuating the positive. And I want you to think about that. The commitment becomes the rationale for accentuating the positive. And the problem is, is that as these signs of progress become less compelling, the White House and its conversation about the war become less convincing, and thus the country becomes more polarized. And thus, because of that, there seems to be more pressure then to demonstrate progress. And you have this now circular um, logic that is, um, I would argue, a bit dangerous. Now, it seems plausible, I think, that senior leaders like Westmoreland were not simply concealing the bad news, but also had been struggling to just understand what they were seeing, to make sense of larger trends within the war. And I think this all raises some important questions. What are we to expect of our senior civil, civilian and military leaders about being candid in a time of war? Veteran correspondent Malcolm Brown actually believed few. Honest reporting is the last thing most people want when the subject is war, Brown argued. Listen to Tui Spatz, who tells the Army War College class in the late 1940s, when testifying before Congress, never lie, but for heaven's sakes, don't blurt out the truth. <laughs> Thus, should we expect those in high office, along with their military commanders, to be somewhat ambiguous, especially in limited wars that do not pose an existential threat to our nation? Should we expect a conversation gap? I mentioned this balancing act that, that everyone in the White House and, and in Saigon is trying to achieve, and that delicate balancing act doesn't seem to have been done quite all that well. And part of the problem, I think, is also that humans, of course, are subject to self-deception. And I think we cannot dismiss the primacy of politics and war. Um, but is it inevitable that public persons shade the truth? And if so, is it possible to do that while maintaining one's moral compass? So I think military leaders like William Westmoreland and Harold K. Johnson no doubt held, withheld the full truth because they believed it would prevent some future harm to the nation's overriding military objective of creating this independent, non-communist, and stable South Vietnam. But politics as they were in the Johnson administration, and perhaps writ large, tended to create these ethical dilemmas. By remaining obedient to political authority, uniform leaders actually had to construct a reality that was based on selective interpretation of the facts which then justified continued sacrifices in a protracted military political struggle. And here I think there is a bit of timelessness to this dilemma of serving officers who must speak to multiple audiences about progress of a less than existential war without visible decision points and without identifiable conventional campaigns. Um, in one sense you see, in Vietnam at least, that the rhetoric uh, 
of strategic progress was blurring the reality of the war itself. And I think it, thus it seems important then to appreciate the vague, if not imprecise, language that is used publicly when assessing progress of these protracted wars. So here then it's possible that language, this vague language, this imprecise language requires us as the public to question the relation of truth to any larger wartime assessment. Um, and certainly I think Vietnam also illustrates the dangers of overselling progress in wartime assessment, that the credibility of a government and its senior officials is a precious commodity that is difficult to replenish once it begins to slip. Um, and perhaps that's the true dilemma of strategic assessment in complex wars without front lines like Vietnam and perhaps like Iraq and Afghanistan, is that unlike football, it's not always clear who's winning and losing. All right, thank you for your attention, appreciate it.